Hello everyone and welcome back, Dom here and on this video I'm going to answer a question that I've been getting a lot, especially after the video that I did for my analog design black box HG2 where I compared the analog gear, the analog box to the plugin. If you haven't watched this video, I'm gonna link it right here. So in this video, I'm going to show you how you can set up any piece of analog gear that you have so that you can use it as a plugin in Cubase. Coming up. So to show you this today, I've removed my black box, my analog design black box AG2 from my chain and I'm going to set it up again so that you can see what the procedure is. It's actually very, very simple. So this is probably not gonna be a very long video. Let me show you how it works. First of all, you need to make sure that you know where you have connected your analog gear into your audio interface, right? Or your converter. If you have an audio interface that has only one output and only one input, uh, you know, maybe a stereo input and stereo output, this is not going to be possible. So I'm gonna tell you straight away, you need a multi-out interface in order to do this and multi-in as well. So in my case, what I've done with my black box is the analog inputs of the device are connected to the analog outputs of my converter. To make things more simple, I hooked up my old 10-year-old RME UFX so that the setup is not so complicated because my setup is a little bit more complicated because I'm doing mastering, so I have a lot of routing in there. But for most of you, you don't need to do all that. So, let's say that my black box goes into the analog inputs of my RME UFX. Let's say it goes to my inputs five and six. And the RME UFX sends from outputs five and six into the inputs of the black box. So in out, right? Output of the UFX, so whatever we send from Cubase goes into the inputs of the black box, okay? The two inputs left and right. And then the signal is processed by the black box and it goes from the outputs of the black box in the back to the inputs of the RME UFX in this case. Most of the times the setup that I use is my AXR with my Lynx Hilo. So let me show you how you can do this. It's actually very simple. All you need to do is go to Studio, go to Audio Connections and this is where you set up your inputs, where you set up your outputs and your control room. If you haven't watched the video about the control room that I've done, I'm gonna link it right here. And uh, as you can see, I have my monitors, I have my inputs right here where I have all the stuff that I use all the time. So my montage, my Sub-37, my OB6, my loopback, my Neve Portico, and so on and so forth. But what you want to go for is this tab, external effects. And as you can see, right here I have my finalizer, which right now is not connected because I've removed my AXR, but I'm going to simulate this with the UFX, okay? So as you can see, this is my portico, this is my mic preamp, and this is what you're listening right now, this is the portico, right? So let me set up my black box now, so that you can do exactly the same. All you need to do is go to add external effects, okay? Add external effects. Let's name this, I'm going to name this black box. And because I also have the plugin, I'm going to call it analog. Okay, now we need to set up our configuration, our send configuration and return configuration. Now, for most devices that you're going to use, if they're stereo, you can just leave it to stereo. In my case, when I want to use my portico as a compressor or as an EQ and not as a channel strip, because it's a mono processor, I need to set it as mono. It's very straightforward. But for now, we need to leave it at stereo. Hit OK, and here we go. Now we have our black box analog right here, okay? And now I need to set up my inputs and outputs. So the send bus and the return bus, okay? So right now they're not connected. All you need to do is go here and select your audio interface. In my case right now, as I said, in order to simplify things, I use the RME UFX. So let's click on this, and it already sets up an output. But we need to change this, right? 
and let's connect it to my return bus as well. So what Cubase does in this case, it will add the first available free inputs and outputs that are not used for the inputs and they're not used for the outputs and they're not used for control room. It makes sense. But this is when you need to know where you have connected your audio interface. For example, if I have connected it to my analog three and four, I have to select three and four. In my case, because right now it's going to my ADAT input and output, I'm going to select ADAT one and two. So this is the send bus. This is what comes out of Cubase, okay? It goes out of Cubase and into our analog device, into the black box in this case. Return is what comes back from the black box and goes back into our audio interface. And in this case, it should match. I totally suggest that you try and match them. So if you're sending out from 8 at 1 and 2, come back to 8 at 1 and 2. If you're sending out from analog 3 and 4, come back to analog 3 and 4. It's easier and it's more clean like this. So in this case, I'm going to select 8 at 1 and 8 at 2. Okay? Perfect. So now all the job is done inside Cubase. The next thing you need to take care of is the mixer on the audio interface level. And unfortunately, this is going to be different per audio interface. For example, in this case, for my RME, as you can see, I make sure that my black box, which is A.1 and 2, is turned all the way down. Why? Because you're going to hear the sound from Cubase. If you have this all the way up, you're going to hear the sound coming out of your analog device twice. You don't want that. And I also want to make sure that my output is all the way down as well, so that I don't hear it twice either there. Now, as I said, these will be a little bit different depending on your audio interface, but the philosophy is exactly the same. Now, once you do this, let's play this loop. Let's open my channel settings, go to my inserts, and let's search for black box. And as you can see, we have black box analog. It's on my external plugins. If you want to find it in the list, let me just show you this as well. You go here and you go Steinberg and then external plugins. And here you will find all your external processors. In my case, I have the black box. I have my finalizer, I have my portico. But of course, after the black box, I could have three more devices in series, so even one output can serve for an entire mastering chain if you want to. So let's click on black box analog and now you will see that this window pops up. Now here you have a few options. You can measure your effects loop for delay, so I can click on that. In my case, I don't have any delay. And uh, I also have my send gain and my return gain. These are really useful and let me show you. Right now, I'm going to play the sound without the black box and then I'm going to add the black box. Let's activate it. Now, why are these two sliders useful? Because I might not want to oversaturate my black box or I might want to saturate my black box. So these sliders give me a lot of control on what kind of signal I feed my analog chain. In this case, maybe I want to tame it a little bit. So I'm not driving the black box so much. But if I push it... Now I'm overloading my black box and because it's a tube device, it does give me a nice color. And then I have a return gain. Why is this important? Because some processors, you know, some uh, pieces of analog gear, they don't have an output trim control. So you might be going in too hot to your converters, maybe your audio interface or into your converters, right? So if you don't have an output trim, then you're in trouble. What this allows you to do is say, okay, I want to go back into Cubase in a more moderate level. So let me show you that as well. So I can overload the black box, but I can come back with a very safe signal. Right, so these two sliders are extremely useful. And that's what it is basically. The only thing that you need to keep in mind if you want to use external gear is that if you want to bounce your track down, it has to be done in real time, of course. And the other thing is if you want to bounce, let's say I want to bounce this one, I want to render in place, let's go like this and drive it a little bit 
and I go render in place. This also needs to happen in real time. So if I go channel settings, okay, so I can print my black box into this loop. I can just hit render and then it will tell me that I need to render in real time. I click OK. And it's all done. As you can see, now I have the output from the black box. And as you can see, it's massively different to what we had before. So in a nutshell, this is how you set up Cubase so that you can use your analog gear pretty much like plugins in Cubase with all the convenience of an insert effect. So I hope this answered your question, guys. Let me know in the comments down below what pieces of analog gear you use with Cubase. You know, I'm a gear freak. And let me know in the comments down below which ones are your favorite processors. I have plans of doing some videos with some of my favorite processors, starting with the Rupert Neve Portico, maybe. So, if you want to watch this video, don't forget to subscribe so you get notified. Click that bell notification icon so that YouTube lets you know that I upload videos. Share this video with anyone you feel they might find it useful. Love you guys. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.